Nigeria started the year 2021 in recession. This was the worst economic recession in 33 years, with a contraction of 3.62% in February of 2021. The National Bureau of Statistics announced that Nigeria exited its second recession in five years by a slight increase of 0.11%. But this was just one of the challenges the country faced in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Nigeria's major source of revenue and main conduit of foreign exchange crude oil took several hits as the effects of the pandemic lingered. High inflation and high unemployment exacerbated Nigeria's macroeconomic risk. There were a number of major moves made in the past year that bear scrutinizing. A review of electricity tariffs across all distribution companies was implemented. It was later reversed. Also, after decades of deliberation on the floor of the National Assembly, Nigerian lawmakers finally passed the Petroleum Industry Bill, and as expected, President Muhammadu Buhari signed it into law. The Petroleum Industry Act is expected to be a game-changer that all have agreed would have a positive impact on this critical sector of the economy. We also have the Finance Bill of 2021, which was passed and is meant to address the shortfalls in previous bills and how they are executed. And there is still the issue of Nigeria's borrowing. Recently, the state approved, or rather the Senate, approved the request for the country to borrow $5.8 billion from international lenders. Many are looking to Africa's largest economy to help drive up the GDP of sub-Saharan Africa in the wake of the pandemic. Has this been a year of change for Nigeria, a year that would move the country towards real growth? Those are questions we look to answer today. I'm Tolulokwe Adela Rubalogun. Welcome. This is Business Edge. My guest today is Taiwo Oyedele. He's a partner and the Africa tax leader at PricewaterhouseCoopers Nigeria. Taiwo, welcome back to Business Edge. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So, Taiwo, let's start from the top, and that's basically starting with the recession. So, while the country exited the worst recession in decades earlier than expected, I would say, it was still the second recession in five years which also leads one to wonder about the economic progress that Nigeria has made um, in the past five, six, seven, eight, nine years. We know COVID-19 was a major factor in that recession, but what else pushed the country over the edge? Yeah, so Nigeria is in reality a country that has been on the edge uh, even before COVID-19. Uh, and I'll say we had our own pre-existing conditions before COVID came and pretty much amplified, you know, all those, uh, you know, difficult uh, issues we were dealing with. So first, you've had uh, GDP growth rate for many years, I'll say maybe over the past seven to ten years, at a rate that is lower than uh, growth in population. In other words, for over the past uh, ten years, um, Nigerians have been growing poorer, which is why it is not surprising uh, that some reports have it that we are now the poverty capital of the world. Because there's no two ways to it. If you grow at a lower rate than your population growth rate in terms of GDP, and then you push more people into poverty. It's even more complicated when you consider that even the small growth we have is not inclusive, which means uh, disproportionately a fewer people are benefiting and the vast majority of Nigerians I see their standard of living deteriorating. At the heart of all of this, I'll say is, you know, one, political leadership. And then number two, I'll say is to do with, you know, also citizenship and, and followership. So when you combine these, uh, you say, well, you know, every country always has to go through difficult times, even the United States of America, even the largest economies in the world. Uh, but you will say, out of those issues you are having to deal with, how many of them are self-inflicted? Mm. So if you do you know, a rough analysis, I probably estimate that in Nigeria, you know, about 70 to 80 percent of the issues we are having to deal with, in my estimation, are self-inflicted, which means if we have the right leadership, 
the right people in the right places, with followership who are holding their leaders to account, and also value and appreciate you know, the right things rather than celebrating mediocrity and corruption, uh, we will probably not be where we are today. We'll be okay. in a much better position overall. So there are two follow-up questions I need to ask in relation to this. So as it stands now, let's put it on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the highest. How susceptible do you think Nigeria is to going back into a recession, another recession, in the next two to three to four or five years? And then if we're looking at this GDP versus population growth number, even if our GDP moves to 5% and our growth and our population growth stays at 2.2, 2.3%, a lot of people still believe it's not enough. That for Nigeria to see real growth, Nigeria needs to be upwards of 8, 9% or even in the double digits. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think three issues. One, on your first question about how vulnerable are we on a scale of one to ten, I would easily say nine. I, I think it's just one thing, and that one thing is not entirely within our control. If the price of crude oil falls back to thirty dollars a barrel, or even forty, we're almost guaranteed to be back in in recession because again, the growth we have now is slow and fragile. We don't have the wherewithal within the economy to guarantee you know some safety nets uh, and some margin of error to say even if the price of product today is 20 within the internal economy we are so diversified such that we'll be fine uh, we're not there yet so it's very high in terms of the probability of uh, you know going back into recession over the next couple of years so the point you're right. If the population growth rate, you know, stays at about 2 point something, 3 percent max, and we have GDP growth rate at 5 percent, it will not solve all the problems, right? What that means is in terms of per capita income, it will be rising, which means Nigeria generally, uh, and that's looking at average, uh, Nigeria generally will become a richer country progressively. Now, the way to make it more impactful is not just increasing from 5 to 8 to 10 in terms of GDP growth rate. What's even more important is to make that growth, no matter how little or low it might be, to be inclusive. To be inclusive means you actually carry along with you the people at the bottom of the pyramid. So in Nigeria today, we have around 80 million people who live in multidimensional poverty. Uh, so they can't even find a meal to eat, there's no water to drink, they can't even think about education and healthcare. That's too much in terms of what we're having to deal with. And it's therefore not surprising that it's easier for terrorists, bandits, and all manner of criminals, including some you know, fraudulent politicians, to easily recruit because these guys are just there and almost entirely hopeless. All right, so I want us to take on two very important um, statistics that many people have been following uh, throughout uh, the year for Nigeria. That's inflation and unemployment. So let's start with inflation. Now, since March 2021, Nigeria's inflation rate has been declining monthly um, as the Central Bank of Nigeria projects that it may drop to about 13% this year and possibly be in single-digit territory by 2022. Do you share the optimism of the central bank? Um, is there active work being done? Because one of the things that's driving this high inflation is food prices, is food inflation. And while we're seeing normal inflation, annualized inflation falling, food inflation has been high and stayed high throughout the year. Yes, I think first I would even you know like to just clarify for the purpose of our audience uh, what it means, right? So it is true that inflation has been moderating over the past, I think, about 10 months. Uh, and we're currently now at about 15.4%. Now, the fact that inflation has been declining consistently over the past few months does not mean that the prices of goods and services are now more affordable than they were before. The way to interpret that data always is to say whenever you have inflation, it means that prices are higher today than they were yesterday. But the rate at which those prices are increasing is declining. So before, maybe prices will double in four months. Now they will double in six months. That's really how you should interpret you know, that moderation of, of inflation. In other words, uh, 
it, it was small good news. Uh, it doesn't solve all the problems. Now, having said that, do I share the optimism of the uh, you know central bank about getting back to single digits? Are we doing anything uh, in concrete terms, uh, particularly to address uh, food inflation? I'll say maybe my optimism is not uh, in a sky. Take food inflation, we have insecurity across the country and even more so in the north. And just today, you know, it was in the press all over the place that, uh, you know, farmers are having to pay taxes uh, to bandits and, and terrorists to be able to harvest. So what does that mean? One, they can't, they are not, they don't feel safe to do their farming. The little they have done, they have to pay taxes to harvest them. Of course, they're going to transfer all of that to consumers. So prices of goods will be going up, particularly food. And this is a country where, you know, the average household consumption that goes into food relative to the entire household income is somewhere around 60%, one of the highest, if not the highest in the world. So which means if you don't tackle food inflation, your hope and aspiration about inflation coming down to single digits will be more uh, like a dream rather than reality. Okay. Tyler, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll get into the unemployment statistics. I'll add a few uh, more numbers to the conversation, and you'll tell me what picture that paints of the Nigerian economy. And while it has not been all gloom and doom, we'll also touch base on some of the um, actions that have happened this year that may put Nigeria on a better footing for 2022. So please hold on. A lot of the conversation focusing on Nigeria, which is Africa's largest economy, has focused, again, on insecurity, on unemployment, and on inflation. There are pictures to be painted, but 2022 is right around the corner, and there have been a few moves that could really position the country for real growth in the next year. We'll get into that part of the conversation after this break. And still with me is Taiwo Oyedele, partner and Africa tax leader for PwC Nigeria. Now, the National Bureau of Statistics' last unemployment report put the rate of unemployment in Nigeria at 33.3%. In September, the chairman of the Presidential Economic Advisory Council, uh, Doyin Salami, said the unemployment rate is projected to increase to 40% by the end of 2021. Let me bring Taiwo back in here. When you look at those numbers, Taiwo, what do you think we're going to get in the next um, report that's going to come out? Where do you think the number will fall? Is it going to increase 40% for Africa's largest economy, most populated black nation on the, on the planet? Is not a number anyone wants to even project, much less uh, see come into reality. What do you think? Yes, I, I do share, you know, those uh, sentiments by Dr. Doin Salami. Um, and I do think that there's only one way you expect the unemployment numbers to go, which is unfortunately uh, it to go up. But the three percent in itself is very high. Bear in mind that the way the unemployment, you know, calculation is done, as well as underemployment, does not take into account that in a country like Nigeria, you don't have social safety net. So when you calculate unemployment and underemployment in Europe, for example, or the U.S., you would imagine that there are people who say, "Well, why should I work and receive a thousand dollars in a month when I can sit down at home and get social security?" Of thousand dollars. So they have a choice. We don't. And what you also find is even when there's someone who is working, either gainfully employed or, you know, in underemployment, they have five, six, seven other people they're supporting. Mm. So you can then imagine when you have 33% unemployment plus underemployment altogether more than 50%. And in fact, when you disaggregate, you also realize that this unemployment rate is much higher amongst youths right, than the rest of the population. So, which is why it's not surprising to see, you know, the reactions around NSAS and the other issues that our young people have. And those are very valid and legitimate. Now, we haven't seen gross capital formation, which essentially means that industries are not investing. FDI has been reducing, so is foreign portfolio investment, and even government does not have the capacity to invest. I think in terms of public expenditure to GDP, Nigeria is probably one of the lowest in the world, maybe higher than Haiti and Venezuela. So if you combine all of that, you're going to ask yourself, where will the employment come from? So at best, it's the resilience of the Nigerian people and the young people just trying to survive. You know, you know we say we hustle in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So it's just those hustling, uh, in my view, that would have been the 
uh, maybe the cushion for unemployment. Otherwise, I would even expect it should be higher than 40%. Ah, Taiwo, the picture you're painting is not a good one. And when we have this conversation with um, the analysts from South Africa, they've expanded their unemployment uh, data to even include those discouraged from seeking work. And that's even a figure we don't really focus on here, which would also possibly balloon that rate as well. But let me add to these figures now. So when you have this backdrop of total public debt stock of about $87.2 billion as of March 2021, Foreign exchange reserves around $41.7 billion as of September of this year. Economic growth rate for the third quarter was around 4.03. And then you add the population growth rate of 2.55% and the unemployment figure. What picture is it painting of Nigeria's economy? What picture is it painting of the health of this country? I think for me, it paints a picture of an economy that is struggling but has enormous potentials uh, to be one of the biggest, greatest, most powerful, and the best place to live on Earth, right? So because all this data about unemployment, inflation is rising, you have insecurity, you have issues with corruption, you have government revenue is low, you can, you can continue with the list of the things that are working. And when you finish your analysis, you quickly conclude that none of this was, was, was made in heaven, right? None of it, all of it are human made. We just created these problems for ourselves, which means we also are the ones to solve the problem. It's good to pray, right? I believe in prayers, uh, but that's not a problem for God to solve. It's human beings to deal with those problems. If you fix those problems, you will be amazed at the possibilities we have in this country. Mm. Um, resilient, hardworking people, you know, happy people ordinarily. Um, and then you find that even despite the hard and difficult economic condition, people are still trying to do their best, even though we've lost, you know, many of our top uh, young people, you know, very talented to other countries who maybe appreciate them more, including doctors, for example. Now, what this picture paints for me is not a hopeless situation. It paints for me that if we take time to understand what the issues are, and why we are where we are, then we can say, well, what should we do about it? For example, if you think about unemployment, and you think about the fact that we have one of the highest rates of entrepreneurship in the world as a percentage of population, uh, estimated somewhere around 40 million micro, small, and medium-sized uh, uh, enterprises, you say, what policy intervention can we introduce to make each of these uh, MSMEs employ just one more person? Just imagine that, just spend time on that for one whole year and spend time with them to say, how can we help you? So each of them employ just one more person and the unemployment rate will go to single digits. So this is not rocket science. Uh, if you think about it today, we are struggling with FX and the exchange rate and the external reserve, like you said. But then part of that, the biggest, Nigeria is one of the countries where you have a lot of contradictions. Today, our number one export is mineral products. Our number one import is also mineral products. Mm. And then we import those refined products, and more than half of it is small goods, according to the consumption data we now have. So imagine you address that. Then the, the pressure on the Naira, because we are importing a refined product, goes down. And therefore, even Naira can appreciate. If Naira appreciates, inflation will come down because a lot of what we consume and raw materials are imported. Okay. So I still hope. But I think it's hope that has to be laced with a lot of reality rather mm. than just optimism. And hard work. So let's talk about something that's giving more people hope. And that's the Petroleum Industry Act. It's finally been signed into law. We're just a few months down the line. So it's not a conversation of what has been implemented and how good it has been. But when you look at the state of the oil and gas sector now, especially when we factor in uh, below than, um, lower than expected crude oil production, given the quota that OPEC has given us and what we're actually producing, there are also the international pressure and the fluctuation in prices, um, as we're seeing Omicron also take over and have an effect on global business as well where are we right now as nigeria exits 2021 where is our oil and gas industry a very crucial sector for this country yes the oil and gas sector is crucial to the nigerian economy it will continue to be crucial and uh, notwithstanding the conversation around net zero and green and environment which i do believe are relevant conversations 
But the reality is even based on all the projections to 2050, 2060, there's still a significant component of the energy mix that will be fossil fuel. So therefore, we need to start by thinking about the energy sector in Nigeria, particularly the oil and gas sector. How do we improve efficiency and how do we diversify even that sector and use it to diversify the rest of the economy? So why are we not producing, why are we not refining um, petroleum, for example? Why are we even exporting? Imagine today we can refine the entire production we may produce on a daily basis uh, and sell to the rest of Africa. Eight out of the top ten economies in Africa have their number one import as refined products. Mm. But they're not importing from us, even us. We're importing anyway from other people. So you need to get to a point where you can make that sector work and use it as a springboard to be able to help the rest of the economy. Whenever the oil sector sneezes in Nigeria, the entire economy catches cold. We can deceive ourselves to say none oil is larger than this, but it really doesn't count. It's not as productive. I do think the PIA, as the Petroleum Industry Act, is a good step in the right direction. I'm not as excited about what I've seen in terms of the way the institutions are being set up, mm. including the commission as well as the authority. I think we're bringing in too much politics into it. Uh, people say government has no business doing business. Mm -hmm. I say, well, there's no problem with government doing business. Government has no business doing politics with business. That's where the problem is. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I'm very drastic in my own you know, opinion. I think that the solution would have been to just privatize NMPC uh, instead of trying to hope that government one day in Nigeria will start behaving well. Okay. You know, we have, we have the conversation about uh, Nigerian Airways. And I'm not excited. It's not because I don't like it. It's because I know that UAE, for example, has the Emirates. You know, the CEO of Emirates today is not even Emiratics. It's British. But the Emir Emiratis are proud because Emirates is now one of the best airlines in the world. But in Nigeria, we still fight over whether it is outside or it's there instead of Yoruba or Igbo. And these are people who already have moved on based on competence and capacity. Very true. If we can do those well, I think that we have significant uh, you know, opportunities for growth, both in the oil and the non-oil sector. Okay, so Taiwo, very quickly, because of time, I just want to get one or two sentences on this. So the Nigerian economy is expected or was projected to grow by 1.8% um, in 2021, even though there is some uncertainty about the outlook. Recovery is meant to be driven by oil prices and domestic demand. Where do you see the country's um, growth ending the year? Will we hit that 1.8 mark? Will we fall short or will we surpass it? Just one or two sentences very quickly. No, I think we will definitely surpass it. Uh, if you look at the past two quarters, we've been recording an you know, average of five, four point something. So I, I expect us to actually be very close to 3% at the end of 2021, um, much better than the projected 1.8%. But I think the bigger conversation is, uh, can we sustain that and can we improve on it and make it even more uh, sustainable? So, Taiwo, you gave me answers, then left me with questions as we wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me, and we'll see you again it's soon. It's my pleasure. Absolutely. All right. So, yes, ending with some questions. If Nigeria can hit the 3% mark for economic growth in 2021, is it sustainable and how will it be sustained? We'll continue the conversation as we're wrapping up the year looking at Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya and major economies around the continent. But now what we're looking at is NC4 to watch. Stick around. And for the stories we're keeping an eye on, we start in East Africa, where Kenya's Salaries and Remuneration Commission is proposing to increase salaries of elected leaders, including MPs and MCAs, even as it claims to have frozen pay increases for civil servants until 2023. In the latest proposal on salary reviews for state officers between 2021 and 2022, as well as 2022 into 2023, the Commission proposes to increase the salaries for MPs by at least 14%, as well as other parliamentary officials, such as speakers and their deputies, majority and minority leaders. Telecommunications giant MTN has announced that its chief executive for South Africa, Godfrey Nsa, uh, will be stepping down from the role effective the 1st of January 2022. Charles Molapisa, currently Group Chief Technology and Information Officer, will be taking over the position.
South African power company ESCOM made 9.2 billion rand, about $569.4 million in net profits in the six months to the end of September, far higher than the 0 0.2 billion it made in 2020. And this suggests that turnaround efforts are starting to bear fruit. Now, the state-owned ESCOM typically performs much better in the first half of its financial year because of higher tariffs and sales in the southern hemisphere winter. And staying on electricity, Nigeria's Federal Executive Council has approved $1.9 million and, and 62.9 million euros for phase one of the Presidential Power Initiative. Now, the PPI is a power upgrade and modernization program between the Nigerian government and Siemens with the support of the German government. In July of 2019, Nigeria signed a power project deal with Siemens AG to increase Nigeria's electricity generation to 25,000 megawatts in six years. And that's our show today. Don't forget that you can head to YouTube and, of course, our app if you've missed any of the conversations so far this week on the big business, economic and financial stories from the continent. Follow us on social media. We are at News Central TV. I'm Toli Lopwe, Adila Rubalogu. Have a pleasant day, and I'll see you bright and early, 11 a.m. West African time tomorrow for Business Edge.